This is a audio visual podcast for Vision Week New Zealand starting June 8. If you have questions, comments, or would like to start, open a dialogue with Ben Ross, you can contact him at ben at collab.nz. Walkable and transit orientated environments. They attract jobs. Do they or do they not? In my previous podcast, which looked at spatial planning at a macro level or an interregional level, we looked at how urban geography and spatial planning, uh, how the private and public sector uses spatial planning to influence uh, behaviour, which then influence urban form. We also have to remember land use begets transport, transport begets land use, and both beget the user environment. In this podcast, Walkable and Transit Orientated Environments, we're going to come down from the macro level, so from the interregional and regional level, down to site level. So we're going to come down to Monaco City Centre, its blank surface car parking lots that it currently has, and how Monaco sits in a transport nexus of both private and public transport, and how we can use spatial planning to influence an industry to come into Monaco, which then influences the economic activity and hopefully also the environmental and social and cultural outcomes in a positive manner as well. Remembering Vision Week New Zealand is about creating an ambitious long-term vision for our lifestyles, including economic, social, cultural and environmental incomes. So using Monaco, using spatial planning and using the creative industries, how can we... um, foster that ambitious long-term vision to help build better and positive lifestyles including economic social cultural environmental incomes not just for monaco and not just for southern auckland but also auckland and nationwide what we're also looking at doing is moving monaco city center from a nine to five monday a friday economy to a full-time economy and this will have impact also on attracting more residents in the area to build critical mass to allow a full-time economy. But I will cover how we use the residential side of the spatial planning ledger to help build a full-time economy in another podcast. In this podcast, we're looking at industry. Again, just a little bit about myself. I reside here in South Auckland of Auckland, Aotearoa, New Zealand. I'm a human experience engineer, urban geographer and spatial planner. And so I work through advocacy and partnerships to improve the human experience and transport urban design and spatial planning for the Southern Auckland area. Whether it's from the big projects like the the Al Monaco uh, Urban Renewal Project to the airport to Botany Rapid Transit System to smaller projects including street coming park and bus lanes. My bounce forward vision in the post-COVID era is we're looking at the 20 minutes, 20, 30 minute city, so I'll interchange the two, but it's the 20, 30 minute city as touted by the Mayor of Paris. The elimination of the super commute, which, it, which is any commute beyond 30 minutes from your home to your job by any transport mode particularly transit and active modes. Better integration and cooperation between the regions, particularly the Golden Triangle, which is Auckland, the Waikato, Hamilton, and the Western Pay of Lehinti, Tauranga. The re-emergence of industry after 40 years of post-industrialization. So we're going to be looking at create, bringing in creative industries today into Monaco and into southern Auckland. Walkable and transit-orientated environments because they attract jobs, hence this podcast today. And this presentation runs in parallel with my previous podcast, The Urban Geography, The Ultimate Expression in Interregional Spatial Planning, Development and Behaviours. So as we drop down from interregional, regional and sub-regional spatial planning, and we come down to site-specific, just a quick 
re recap there again that on how spatial planning systems work by using the public and private sector to influence that distribution of people and activities. In this case, we're trying to influence creative industries to come into Monaco to support Southern Auckland, Auckland and New Zealand, and to turn the Monaco economy from a nine to five uh, public sector uh, retail environment to a full 24 seven economy. And again, we're looking at this on the employment side of the ledger. Again, in another podcast, we will look at the residential side of the ledger because the two go hand in hand. Dropping down to site specifics for Monaco. As I said, Monaco City Centre has a nine to five economy, so it's basically around government and council services and retail from the mall and the outlet stores rather than a 24. Uh, seven economy that you might find um, not even Auckland City Centre, but overseas. There's been a push by various authorities over the years. The latest being Panuku, a council-controlled organisation of Auckland Council, to increase the residential base and diversify the employment base in the El Monaco region, which covers 600 hectares. Uh, they're looking at, I think it's 20,000 new residents and 10, up to 10,000 new jobs in the area alone. But Monaco was born in the 1960s around an autocentric model. So it was built away from the rail line, but close to the new, new developing southern motorway at the time. But under our, our Monaco, uh, Monaco would again become Southern Auckland's core. So Auckland runs a dual core model, the Auckland City Centre and Monaco City Centre. And it's to turn Monaco into a walkable city centre that's more and that is more accessible by transit. For example, airport to Botany Rapid Transit that runs from the airport to Puanui Station, so that intersects the southern and eastern lines and later intercity services from Auckland to Hamilton and maybe later Tauranga. A to B continues from Ponoi to Monaco, where the rail state Monaco rail station is for the eastern line, where the bus station is for commuter services and intercity bus services, and then it carries on to Botany, metropolitan centre itself. So A to B as a 18.5 kilometre uh, transit line, whether it's bus or light rail, forms some quite crucial links in there. So that's looking at so not only just local, but also sub-regional, regional, and inter-regional as well. Subsequently, because of that, and also you've got the Southern Motorway State Highway 1, the Southwestern Motorway State Highway 20, the Great South Road forming the road links, oh, and Tiarangi Drive as the east-west road link, which is ironically A to B will run down that as well forming the road link. So Monaco sits on a transport nexus that proves to be its asset and its liability. But looking on the asset side of the coin, we can use this to encourage creative industries. And creative industries would be one way of diversifying Monaco's retail and public sector employment base. Again, given Monaco's location as the core of Southern Auckland is access to the Waikato in Hamilton and it's 10 minute direct access to Auckland Airport. Creative industries. So as it says here, creative industries refers to the economic activities around uh, the use of knowledge and information. Uh, there's no set definitive recognized terminology around creative industries yet but if you look at the list there from advertising to architecture to design to film and just have noted that i had found out while i was doing this podcast that worry which is the industrial complex to the south west, to the south and southwest of monaco has a film studio that is out for hire so we have film studios in our industrial complex that is five minutes away from Monaco itself. So film, music and performing, 
publishing software, TV, radio, video games. All forms of creative industry and there is 750,000 people that reside in southern Auckland alone. Creative industries are also seen as a way to not only diversify the economic base, but also to build resilience into it, especially in the post-COVID era, when manufacturing and tourism might take the hits in the short term. Because worry has a very strong manufacturing base, but it did take a major setback in the COVID era. So creative industries were able to help build resilience in Southern Auckland's industrial base, especially through the post-COVID era. Monaco's advantages, again, with creative industries and walkable and trans-orientated developments. Significant development opportunities. We've got large parcels of land, especially surface parking lots in Monaco City itself. A lot of that is in public ownership at the moment. Monaco is well connected to the rest of the, re uh, rest of the region and even interregion. As I said, you've got that transport nexus. And you've got the locational advantages as well. And the concentrations of retail educational. We've got MIT and AUT and now the University of Auckland as well as proximity to the rest of the Golden Triangle and, again, Auckland Airport. This is from Panuku, taking a drone shot, looking down from the west. So if we get the cursor, this is the MIT and the rail station. This is the bus station, including Intercity Bus. This is where, this is the old Civic Building, Kotoko House, where the council services are based. We have apartments here, the mall here. Rainbow's End here, civic infrastructure back here. This big interchange you can see along here is the State Highway 1, State Highway 20 interchange. You can see the residential base in the back. You might just see interspersed over places, parking lots. Perfect to rebuild over. And in front of us is Hayman Park. So everything is there to support the creative industries on the employment side of the ledger. And now it's a case of trying to encourage them here to make it happen. So how do you do it? Well, it's going to be through your transportation. Having four roads like, as shown in this tweet from Jennifer Kismet, Kismet sorry, here. So this would be uh, Worry Station Road, Monaco Station Road, the Great South Road, Lambie Drive, uh, even Romwood Avenue, even though it's a two-lane version, and Cavendish Drive would be examples of this. This is where our liability, and uh, most of them are set to 60 kilometers an hour. With well, Romwood being the other one at 50. This is where our transport liability kicks in for Monaco. As you can see here, and as you could imagine, it is not very hospitable or humane. Why would people want to come and work, let alone live, or live and let alone work in Monaco if the situation is like this? Good luck trying to get across the road from your creative industry workplace to a place where you might do social interaction over lunch or even dinner or from your apartment. What we're trying to achieve, although it's been set back at the moment, but what we're trying to achieve through spatial planning and transport play is to come from here where the roads are wide and 60 kilometers an hour and wouldn't attract a lot is to down here and this would be a perfect example of Monaco Station Road and Lambie Drive because we've got a transit a bus transit connection here that would be airport to Botany which does run down Lambie and Monaco Station Roads so you're trying to make it more humane you're trying to have your transit connections you still have your general lanes you've got your green infrastructure so stormwater gardens they've got parking in this case, but parking doesn't need to be there all the time. You've got your separated cycleways. You've got your tr green infrastructure again. So again, the stormwater infrastructure in your trees. LED lighting. And wider footpaths that allow street activity like uh, street stalls, seating, bike parking, bike repair stations. And most of all, the limits are dropped back down to 40, between 30 and 40 kilometers an hour. Unless it's a shared space, then it's dropped down to 10, walking space. So 
use we turn our transport liabilities into transport assets which build off the current assets we have which is the rail station and the bus station with their respective services by humanizing the streets once your streets are humanized you are likely more likely to attract those that creative industry which would take over the old surface parking lots and once that happens you also will probably find residents wanting to move in so they don't they would use these modes to get from their place of work or home and and vice versa while at the same time it would also allow the supporting of commerce to support the industry remember in my spatial planning podcast i said when you're doing exercises like this city building which includes retrofitting so we're retrofitting monaco to build creative industry to build the residential base to create the full-time economy you go with industry first which is your creative industry then your residents to work in that industry then the commerce to support the residents who need amenities and commerce to support the industry through professional often professional services as well as retail when you need to go out for lunch so you've got that whole chain sitting in there so you're doing the city building again as i mentioned in the last podcast you're engaging spatial play but we've just come down to site specific and this is an example of the contrasts of our transport system in monaco here is the bus station before it opened it is now quite heavily patronized uh patronized yep yeah, patronized the intercity buses meet here and your normal services meet here including the airport bus the rail station sits below uh, mit here so there's there's an asset there of where it sits right we've got the transit hub transit nexus right there but at the same time we also have the liability which does not make things attractive at all this is monaco station road four lanes grass median very inhospitable to cross 60 kilometers an hour on one side and 50 kilometers on an hour on the other side with a peak only bus lane as well this comes from the legacy this used to be state highway 20 connecting the southwest to state highway one before state highway Tw the full motorway was built itself but we've still got the legacy of a rat run road here this is rainbow's end here this is the mall here Good luck trying to cross that on the Saturday. It isn't very nice. It doesn't drive things, doesn't drive uh, amenity or attractive value that much at all. In fact, all it do does is um, push off induced demand, which means more traffic. And that will not attract creative industries at all compared to something like this. So Monaco has the contrasts. Good, bad. And remember, we're trying to go from this to this to support the creative industries which then supports the residents which then supports the commerce which supports the residents and the industry coming back up the chain how do transit oriented environments attract those creative jobs so looking at the city of hamilton which i believe is in canada i'm a geographer should know this they ask this question it is understood pedestrian friendly and transit oriented environments are in uh, elements of good planning but they also seem to be understood as good business by broader or they say municipal for us it's public sector make decision making community so for that it would be auckland transport auckland council panuku and at auckland tourism events and economic development so in Hamilton, not Hamilton, New Zealand, but Hamilton in North America, looked at the creative industries and why they were attracted to, in this case, down the downtown. For us, it would be Monaco for Southern Auckland. And it was discovered that the downtown of Hamilton had a more walkable environment compared to elsewhere. And that's what just naturally attracted the indus creative industries, which then attracted the residents, which then attracted the commerce, in which that commerce again supports the residents and the industry. So the questions were then posed, and this can now be asked of Monaco when you're doing the spatial planning review, 
research. What is the measure of walkability in the downtown? And in Monaco, it's not that flash, but owing to our wide roads at the moment. Where else in the city can we see these levels of walkability? Well, for Auckland, that is literally everywhere, including Auckland city centre. What is the geography of transit access in Hamilton? Now, I've transferred to, to Monaco. The transport access in Monaco is pretty superb. Because all the commuter, all the South Auckland commuter buses, including the airporter from Auckland Airport, converge into Monaco, as well as the intercity buses, as well as the rail services. And then the airport to Botany will allow that crosstown connection between Botany, Monaco, Pūnui, which has the rail lines again, and the airport. And is there a spatial relationship between walkable walkability, transport access, and creative jobs in a city wide? The answer to that is yes. Going on, strengthening that link between the walkability and transit accessibility, and the jobs will be important for the both urban centres. It allows the building of the it allows to diversify the economic base. It, aka it builds resilience into the Monaco and the South Auckland economy and it contributes to bring it into a full-time full -time economy. A 9 to 5 economy Monday to Friday is not resilient and as we saw in the COVID situation, Monaco was a ghost town. And the post-COVID era we have a chance to diversify that economic base through creative industries and making sure Monaco is walkable and its transit accessibility is first class. Now, we know resources are limited at the moment, especially with Auckland Council going on a retrenchment drive, while central government is pouring out money through public works. So we have to be uh, nimble in how we build these industries, how we build the supporting infrastructure, and how we build then the residential base to attract that talent to a point that the creative industries the residents and the supporting commerce are at critical mass where they are able to sustain each other without much public intervention or subsidies and continue to grow and diversify through natural mechanics rather than having to publicly subsidize it all the time as Monaco has had over its 60 year life. Going into the extension as I begin to wind up. It's not just about the industry as well, although one of my bounce forward visions was, was to revitalize industry, but also extending hospitality and new residence as well. Because attracting creative industries, so we're using spatial planning, so we're getting the public and private sectors to use spatial planning to influence behaviors and outcomes of the urban form in Monaco and Southern Auckland. To transform Monaco from that 9 to 5 Monday to Friday economy to a full-time economy. Now the transit system is set up in, Auc in Monaco and the walkable transit network is nearly there. It's just crossing the roads is a bit of a bit of a hit and miss at the moment. But get these in place, they will support the creative industries. And these same systems, so it's the transit, the walking, and the creative industries, will then support the visitors and, su and support other industry industries, or in this case, commerce, hospitality, and entertainment. And if hospitality and entertainment are well supported and are in a diversified state, or more to the point, a critical mass state, they will attract more visitors and more residents into the area, especially on evenings and weekends. Do And doing that, and through attracting also permanent residents who go, oh, this is a very viable, livable area with a full-time economy of industry, residential, commerce, which includes entertainment and hospitality, we are likely to move into the Monaco City Centre area as either singles, young professionals, or families. And when this happens, further development occurs. And as I mentioned mentioned just earlier, you will get critical mass not only to support the industries, which was the original intent, but other industries as well. The critical and it will do it on its own 
inertia without much intervention or subsidies, heavy subsidies from the public sector. So it builds on. I should point out that pre-COVID, all of Mon uh, so the last the the boom we had before COVID came into the equation, all of Monaco's entertainment and hospitality facilities were full to the point of crowds and waiting lists. And I had commented that we are going to need AT to help to support it. That's because we were starting to see a diversification in our employment base and there was constant reports going up of more hotels coming in to support that employment base and getting ready to build more apartments as the construction sector allowed. The hospitality sector was full, which means Monaco was in a good situation to support what she not only what she had, but to support and influence new spatial behaviours and spatial forms and bringing in those creative industries. So we weren't starting from a blank state. Monaco's entertainment and hospitality scene was in a pretty good state. It won't be at the moment post-COVID, but it showed people had confidence in the city centre, thus using spatial planning to get creative industries into Monaco is going to be vital, but it was there. In conclusion, spatial planning can be used by the public and private sector to influence the distribution of people and activities at various scales. Previous podcast that was at interregional level. In this podcast, we've dropped down to site specific. We've dropped down to Monaco City Centre, and we're looking at trying to create or influence the fostering of creative industries in Monaco. The hospitality scene, ironically, is already there to attract them there. Further developing the transit and walkable transport network and getting residents and further supporting commerce in there will help encourage the, the industry. But again, as it was noted, we have negative and influence, uh, sorry, negative and positive transport influences, even though Monaco sits on the on a, on a transit nexus. And the large parking lots can, at the moment, be a negative, but they can also be a positive. As soon as we w work on that transit and walking connections, it will they will heavily influence the spatial form and the spatial behaviours, which in this case, we're trying to get creative industry into Monaco. Creative industry allowing to diversify the employment base, which then diversifies the residential base, which then supports more co uh, further commerce, apart from the commerce that's already established there, and that commerce then supports the residents and industries back up. This has been an audiovisual podcast on walkable and transit oriented environments supporting jobs. If you have questions, comments, or would like to start a conversation, you can contact me at ben at collab.nz. This has been a podcast for Vision Week New Zealand starting June 8.